So yesterday we'd gotten as far as the idea of chewing and swallowing. We got through a little bit of uh, secretion in the mouth and then motility in terms of chewing and swallowing. swallowing. We're going to pick that idea up today and we're going to talk a little bit about the esophagus because the esophagus now is going to be an epithelium lined muscular tube. Now it's true, wherever we go in the GI tract we have a, a continuous layer of epithelial cells and that's true here in the esophagus as well. We have a series of epithelial cells attached to an underlying muscle layer. And in the upper third of the esophagus, we'll have skeletal muscle. And in the lower two thirds, there'll be smooth muscle. The skeletal muscle is the muscle that's activated by lower motor neurons found in the brain stem. These, this is the, these are the lower motor neurons that are activated when you get that wad of chewing gum too far back and you lose control of it and you activate the reflex of the swallowing reflex. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But mostly what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about what's going on in the stomach. The esophagus is nothing more than a tube that connects the pharynx or back of the throat or back of the mouth to the stomach itself. The stomach is a hollow structure and it's going to be constructed of several layers. Now when we talk about the anatomy of the stomach we sort of blithely talk about these so-called tunics or layers. The layers are first the mucosa. The mucosa is made of epithelial cells and that will be the innermost layer. This will form the lining around the lumen of the stomach. The mucosa includes not only the epithelial cells but an underlying very loosely connected connective tissue layer called areolar connective tissue. There will be some blood vessels in this. And then beyond this areolar connective tissue, there's then the submucosa. Submucosa is basically connective tissue, but it's enriched for elastin, and that should be no surprise. After a big meal, you know you can actually distend your stomach, and that distension comes from the ability of having the submucosa with its elastin filaments able to stretch. But one of the major things we're going to find in the stomach is that it's a churn. Motility is one of the major functions of the stomach and that motility is governed or regulated by s layers of smooth muscle. There are three layers of smooth muscle sitting just beyond the submucosa. Those three layers of smooth muscle can be regulated to move the food inside the stomach back and forth and back and forth, basically churning the stomach contents to increase the surface area of whatever it is we've eaten. And then finally, attached to the smooth muscle layers will be the, something called the serosa. The serosa, serosa is simply a mesothelium, a continuous layer of mesothelial cells. The mesothelial cells are not, are, they look like an epithelium, but they're not defined as an epithelium because they're not continuous to the outside world. This mesothelial layer will be attached to the stomach and will be continuous with other mesothelial structures which form the peritoneum. Then, finally, we're here, beyond the, what we're then going to talk about is what's going on with the epithelia of the mucosa. When we think about the function of the stomach, of course there's motility, which is the smooth muscle, but beyond that there's going to be secretion from the mucosa. The mucosa is going to be this complicated set of epithelial cells that are regulating the secretion of any number of molecules. The first set, subset of epithelial cells we're going to talk about are things called goblet cells. The goblet cells, the function of the goblet cell is simply to secrete mucus. They're similar to the epithelial cells in the salivary glands we talked about yesterday where they're able to secrete a sort of slippery slimy mucus. But now these goblet cells are generating a mucus layer that's going to lie on the apical surfaces of the epithelial cells. This becomes a protective layer because one of the things we're going to find as we work our way through this is that the contents of the stomach is remarkably corrosive. It has a pH down around 2 and it's chock full of proteolytic enzymes. So the contents of the stomach are capable of digesting literally the epithelial cells of the mucosa. So one of the protective barriers here will be the mucosa overlying all the ep epithelial cells and the, I'm sorry, the protective layer will be the mucus 
which is secreted by mucosal cells called goblet cells, and they will provide a protective layer over the apical surface of all of these epithelial cells. Now, in addition to the epithelial cells forming the lining of the stomach, there are a subset of epithelial cells that are thrown into these folds. Now, the way I'm going to draw it is going to remind you of a, a, an exocrine gland, but in fact, it won't be quite that simple. There'll be several cell types. This is going to be called a gastric pit and included in the epithelial cells, but your phone I'd appreciate it, included in the epithelial cells of the gastric pit will be cells called chief cells. The function of the chief cell is to release a molecule called pepsinogen. Now it's worth looking at this molecule because it has this suffix, O-G-E-N. We ran into this earlier when we were talking about renin and angiotensinogen. Well, here we have pepsinogen. It's an inactive precursor. It doesn't digest anything. But once it gets out into the lumen of the intestine, this pepsinogen will be converted into an active component called pepsin. And the pepsin then is a proteolytic enzyme capable of converting proteins into peptides. And we'll see a little bit about how that's done. The major player we're going to spend some time on here are the parietal cells. The function of the parietal cells are to secrete hydrogen ion. Now, for a long time, it was thought that the hydrogen ion played a role in digestion because we could acidify the contents of the stomach and also thought that was uh, important to digest. It turns out it's not. Mostly the reason we secrete hydrogen ion into the lumen of the stomach is to inhibit bacterial growth. Now, we don't have to go, very, go back very far in time when almost every meal we would take in had a lot of bacteria with it, and this is one of the places where we would inhibit that proliferation of bacteria. Probably in our modern world with, with decent public health systems, it's not such a big deal. But not so long ago, it really was important to us. And so these parietal cells play this important role of inhibiting bacterial growth in that slurry of food stuff that we'll have stored in the stomach. But the parietal cells are not active all the time. They're only active after a meal. And so I want to talk a little bit about how we regulate the function of the parietal cells. And this will be part of the hormonal secretion story that we find in the mucosa of the stomach. There are going to be two major cell types we're going to talk about that are going to affect the parietal cells. They'll be in the same neighborhood. They'll be within the epithelium of the gastric pits. They won't be far from the parietal cells. These are the so-called G cells. The G cells get their name because they release a peptide hormone called gastrin. The gastrin goes out into the blood vascular compartment and in the blood vascular compartment functions as a true endocrine hormone. It will go throughout the blood vascular system and find its way back and bind to G protein coupled receptors on parietal cells. The enterochromaffin like cells are also epithelial cells, but they're really just a fancy mast cell because they release histamine. And the histamine molecules are now going to function in a kind of paracrine fashion. The enterochromaffin-like cells, sometimes known as the ECL cells, these ECL cells will be located not very far away from the parietal cells. And the histamine released on the basolateral side can diffuse through the extracellular space and bind to G-protein-coupled receptors on the parietal cells. So the major regulating molecules for the parietal cells and their release of hydrogen ion will be gastrin, histamine, and then the third character that we see over and over again in digestion, astrocholine, from the parasympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system. We'll talk a little bit about the muscarinic receptors here. But in all three of these cases, they're G-protein coupled receptors. So let me show you this picture because I think it's a, it's a, a pretty picture and it, it gives you a much more realistic view of the salivary glands than that simple series of blue ovals I put on the board. So to orient you here, this is, this is going to be the salivary duct, and these are this, this is the duct epithelium, and if we'd follow this duct, it would go out into the surface of the tongue or the sublingual gland, someplace in the mouth. Now, some of these branches here, and they've shown this as a sort of a composite kind of salivary gland, and we simply showed one type 
last time, which would be this so-called serous acinus. These are the aciner cells that are releasing the fluid, the, the dilute uh, saliva that goes out and forms saliva in your mouth. But there are also these other, other glands which not only generate the, the watery saliva, but also generate a kind of mucus saliva, and that's what allows us to make the food we eat slippery so that it's easier to swallow. So we've managed to chew the food, we've managed to moisten it, we've managed to make it swallowable, and I just want to take a moment here to talk about, again, my crude mouth and pharynx and esophagus, where back here is the soft palate. And the soft palate contains sensory neurons. And these sensory neurons find their way, the sensory neurons find their way during development to the brainstem. And there's a circuit here. There's kind of a reflex circuit where a sensory in, usually through an interneuron, and out to a lower motor neuron. So this is a lower motor neuron. And of course, the lower motor neuron innervates skeletal muscle. If we look at the muscle in the back of the throat, the pharynx, and also extending into this tube, which is the esophagus, we can follow a continuous layer of epithelial cells. But outside that continuous layer of epithelial cells will be a layer of skeletal muscle. The upper one-third of the esophagus, at least in humans, contains skeletal muscle. And then immediately beneath that, extending this tube down, extending the lining of epithelial cells, around that region, in the lower two-thirds, this is not drawn to scale, in the lower two-thirds, we have smooth muscle. So when we think of the esophagus, we can think of this basically as a tube lined with epithelium and surrounded by skeletal and smooth muscle. This tube is now going to open into the stomach itself. At the interface here between the esophagus and the stomach is a 
smooth muscle, sphincter. The sphincter has a name. It's called the esophageal or sometimes cardiac sphincter. The function of the sphincter is to open when we swallow food and allow food to come into the stomach. But under normal circumstances, this sphincter ought to be closed tightly. Because one of the things we're going to see here in a moment is the contents of the stomach are constantly being churned back and forth and back and forth by smooth muscle layers around the stomach. If this sphincter doesn't work properly, if it doesn't hold itself tightly closed, there's a potential for contents of the stomach to be regurgitated into the esophagus. This is an esophageal. reflux disease. Now this becomes dangerous because the contents of the stomach, we'll see here in a moment, not only contain proteolytic enzymes but also have a pH down less than two. So this is a really corrosive kind of, of contents of the stomach. Now the lining of the stomach is going to be protected by a layer of mucus but there isn't a mucus layer over these epithelial cells. And so the concern is that if the esophageal sphincter is no longer competent to prevent the movement of the contents of the stomach up into the esophagus, what we commonly call heartburn, if it isn't competent, then over time the contents of the esophagus, I'm sorry, the contents of the stomach will erode the epithelial cells of the esophagus. And in some cases, over long periods of time, this can make the epithelium of the esophagus subject to becoming carcinomas. So you get cancer sometimes from the continual destruction of these epithelial cells and their failure to divide properly. So we go to great lengths to provide people with medications which prevent mostly the acidification of the stomach contents so they don't damage those epithelial cells. But fundamentally, every time we swallow, the motility of chewing and swallowing is continuing to the motility of the skeletal and smooth muscle, bringing a bolus of food into the stomach. So what I want to think about now, though, on this panel over here, is the anatomy of the stomach. And what I mean by the anatomy of the stomach is I mean the layers, which are often called tunics of the stomach. And we'll start from the inside. So I, I, I need a, an outline here, so I'm going to draw the outline in black. But all along the inside here is going to be a continuous layer of epithelial cells. So this is going to be an epithelium. These epithelial cells are attached to a loosely organized, a loose, a loosely organized layer of areolar connective tissue. Taken together, the epithelium with the areolar connective tissue is said to be the mucosa. Now immediately below that, below the loose connective tissue and the epithelial cells, and I'm going to show this as a, a layer in orange, all the way around the stomach, is a region called the submucosa. 
Now, the submucosa is fundamentally connective tissue. It's really analogous to the dermis we see in skin. And particularly in the stomach, the submucosa is rich for elastin. That's no surprise. After all, the stomach that, as we think about it, we know if we eat a big meal, it's going to distend, it's going to get bigger. And so we have this capacity to expand our stomach. And that expansion is at least in part accommodated by the elastin. Now on the outside of that are going to be three layers. Attached to the submucosa will be these layers of smooth muscle. So now you imagine this vat, this vat whose inner layer is epithelium, whose next, next layer is a stretchy layer of connective tissue, and beyond that is smooth muscle. Now that smooth muscle now can contract, and by contracting, it can force the contents of the stomach back and forth and back and forth. And after we've eaten a meal, that's what we're doing. We're squishing the fluid inside the stomach back and forth and back and forth. We're mixing it, and fundamentally, we're increasing the surface area of the food we've eaten. Certainly when we chew it, we initiate that increase in the surface area. But now, if you put your phone away, I'd appreciate it. But now that we're down in the stomach, we're using this smooth muscle to regulate the motility, squishing the food back and forth. And then finally, on the outside here, I'm going to put this in brown, the attached to the smooth muscle layer is a layer, a single layer, of mesothelial cells. Now, this mesothelium will attach to the smooth muscle. It will actually uh, extend around, attach to the body wall, and become something known as a peritoneum. I don't think I spelled that right. The peritoneum now is the extension of these mesothelial cells which are attached to the smooth muscle. So now we have the tunics. We have the mucosa, the submucosa, the muscular layer, and then the serosal or mesothelial layer. And that goes all the way around the stomach. So we've described how this stomach, the, the smooth muscle, serves as a churn. And we've discussed a little bit about the idea that this is also a storage vat. And if you look at different animals, you find that different animals have a different proportional volume of their stomach to their body size. And some of the smallest stomachs in terms of body size occur in herbivores, where herbivores are out grazing all day long. So they're taking food in all the time and all the time, and they're simply passing it through the stomach. And you find then some of the largest stomachs, ours, is, ours and pigs are pretty much intermediate, so we eat now and again. But some of the largest stomachs are in animals that only eat occasionally and tend to be lower on the predatory food chain. So a classic example of large stomachs is in dogs or canids. If you think about what canids do, what they have to do for a living, is they have to go out in a pretty, a pretty hostile world, find something to eat, eat it quickly before the higher order predators get there, and, and, and then retreat. And you see this in dog behavior all the time. I mean, if your dogs are like my dog, you put the food down and it's gone in about 20 seconds. And so these guys, these guys are really programmed to eat fast. And they store the food in their stomach. And this is particularly true for a bitch and her pops. And what she'll do is she'll go out and she'll find food. And she'll gobble down as much food as she can. And she effectively will store it in her stomach. So she has this big bat. And then she will come back to where her den of pups are. And then she won't exactly vomit. She'll actually re she'll reverse the the peristalsis and regurgitate the food and present it to the pups.
so it's partially digested. And as she's weaning her pups, she can provide them with this partially digested food. But what's more, this stomach on a dog has to be enormous with respect to its body size, simply to act as that storage vat. So the function of the stomach is fundamentally to be a churn and a storage vat. But in addition to the churn and the storage vat, we do begin to do some level of secretion. We're going to next talk about the secretion of proteolytic enzymes, and then following that, the secretion of acids. Because we'll find that the pH of the stomach contents could be less than 2. So the underlying tissues are at a pH of around 7. And the pH of the stomach contents could be less than 2. That's five orders of magnitude more acidic. So this is a really acidic set uh, environment. But now let's think a little bit about the epithelial cells of the mucosa. So what I'm going to do here in this panel is describe the epithelial cells. of the stomach, mucosa. And we'll draw this like we've drawn so many simple epithelia before. So these are the epithelial cells. Of the stomach. Mucosa. These epithelial cells lining the stomach are covered by, oh, about 200 micrometers, about 200, about two tenths of a millimeter thick layer of mucus. The mucus serves as a protective layer. lying over the apical surfaces of epithelial cells. So these epithelial cells are covered by a layer of mucus, really protecting their delicate apical surfaces from the proteolytic enzymes and low pH of the stomach content, contents. But there's an extension here of epithelial cells. Now some of these cells, both in the lining and up here near the neck, are modified epithelial cells called goblet cells. And the function of the goblet cells is to secrete mucus. But down here in this structure, I'm going to put an arrow to it and name it as a gastric pit. Down within the gastric pit, there are specialized epithelial cells. Gastric pit is lined with an epithelium, but among these cells down here will be stem cells. One of the characteristics of the mucosa throughout the gastrointestinal tract is we have stem cells that are continually dividing to replace the overlying cells. It, it turns out that we'll turn over all of the epithelial cells in our mucosa of our stomach and small intestine in a matter of 10 days to two weeks. We're constantly making new cells. And these stem cells are largely undifferentiated epithelial cells and then they can differentiate into goblet cells or some of the other secretory cells we're going to talk about here in a moment. So one of the characters I want to put in here, I'm going to put it in here in, in red, 
This is said to be a chief cell. The chief cell secretes pepsinogen. We take in food, it contains fat, it contains protein, and that signals these chief cells to secrete this molecule of pepsinogen. So if we draw one of these cells, and this is apical, from the apical surface, we'll re be releasing pepsinogen. Pepsi pepsinogen is an inactive precursor for pepsin. Pepsin is, in fact, a proteolytic enzyme. And this proteolytic enzyme converts proteins not individual, into an individual amino acids, but it converts proteins into peptides. Peptides of, oh, maybe 30, 50, 60 amino acids. But it's worth saying here that, as we described in the introduction, whenever you see this suffix, O-G-E-N, this means it's an inactive precursor. And I think you can recognize that if we had contained within these vesicles an active proteolytic enzyme, we'd destroy the vesicles, we'd destroy these cells. So in order not to do that, we release the pepsin in an active form called pepsinogen. And then when this pepsinogen gets out into the lumen of the stomach, in the lumen of the stomach, the pepsinogen is converted to pepsin. It's a remarkably simple step. There's a, there is an amino acid sequence that lies over the active site in the pepsin molecule. And the active, any active pepsin molecules out here in the lumen of the stomach now will cut loose that little peptide. And when you cut loose that little peptide, it opens up the active site and the pepsinogen becomes activated as pepsin and it's now capable of converting proteins into peptides. But there's another character in here. I'm going to put this one in in purple. And this cell type is called a parietal cell. The function of the parietal cell is to secrete hydrogen ion to acidify. The stomach contents. One of the things I'll emphasize here, we'll come back to, is that the parietal cell is under hormonal control. But I'm going to go back up to the upper panel here and draw one of these parietal cells as a larger cell so we can begin to think about how it generates hydrogen ion and how it's regulated. So I'm simply going to draw that purple cell we have in the gastric pit above, make it bigger, and then begin thinking about its orientation with respect to the lumen of the gastric pit and the underlying blood vascular system. So we'll have Showing here, this is meant to represent a parietal cell. The parietal cell is attached to a basal lamina. So that tells us that this is the basilar membrane. And up here is the apical membrane 
as it faces the lumen, this is an apical membrane, and it faces the lumen, of the gastric pit. Now you've noticed, you may notice that I've done something strange with the apical membrane. I've, I've made these infoldings in it. That's actually an important characteristic of these parietal cells. They're unusual in that their apical membranes are thrown into these folds. If we look carefully at those extensions of the apical membrane, we find they have a couple of characteristics. They are enriched, for what I'll show you here in brown, are potassium channels. And then along with those potassium channels will be now another protein. I'll put it in orange. And this protein is said to be a hydrogen ion potassium ATPase. It's actually an antiporter. These potassium channels in these sort of blind canyons, these, these box canyons, blind ended structures, blind alleys, if you will, by having potassium channels here, we now allow potassium to flow out of the cell. Because remember, the cytoplasmic concentration of potassium is always 110 millimolar or so. But if there's no potassium out here, we have channels, it will flow down its concentration gradient, the potassium will leave. So potassium goes out here and increases the potassium concentration. Then this potassium, I'm sorry, the hydrogen potassium ATPase can snag a potassium ion on the outside and it can snag a hydrogen ion, the hydrogen ion red, it can snag a hydrogen ion in a cytoplasm. And then when it cleaves ATP to ADP and PI, the hydrogen ion is kicked out to the outside and the potassium ion comes back into the cell. So in this way, if we go back up to our upper panel here, What we're doing is we're secreting hydrogen ion from the apical side of this cell out into the lumen of the gastric pit to go out into the lumen of the stomach and now acidify the stomach contents. But the question then arises, where's the hydrogen ion come from? After all, we have to have sufficient hydrogen ion to get the volume of the stomach, pH down around two, we have to increase the hydrogen ion concentration out here some five, uh, five orders of magnitude over what we have in the extracellular space. So where do we generate that hydrogen ion? And this actually is an old story. Down here, immediately beneath the the parietal cell in the areolar connective tissue, perhaps in, in the submucosa, is a capillary. And this capillary will be carrying, at least to some extent, carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide now can get into this parietal cell. And in the parietal cell, there's going to be an enzyme that we've seen before called carbonic anhydrase. And of course, what it will do is it will take the carbon dioxide and it will now convert, I'm sorry, carbon dioxide plus water, and it will give rise to a hydrogen ion and a bicarbonate ion. This is the same story we saw in the alveolar cells, the pneumocytes, of the alveolus in the lung. 
And in the lung, what was happening is that we were taking bicarbonate and hydrogen ion, recombining the CO2 and water, and blowing off the CO2. In the tissues, we were doing exactly this, however. In the tissues, we were taking carbon dioxide, converting the carbon dioxide into hydrogen ion and bicarbonate. The hydrogen ion in the blood was then being bound to the hemoglobin and buffered. We don't have a good buffer here. So what we do is we use this hydrogen ion to bind to the hydrogen ion potassium ATPase. We now remove the hydrogen ion from the cell, kick it into the extracellular space to acidify the contents of the stomach. Meanwhile, down here, this bicarbonate ion is moving back into the blood. After a large meal, there's sufficient bicarbonate ion moving from the parietal cells into the blood to generate something called the alkaline tide. Effectively, we are increasing blood pH. Where we're increasing the blood pH, we're using the hydrogen ion to lower the pH of the contents of the stomach. So that's how this cell secretes hydrogen ion. But the cell, too, is under hormonal control. So let me go back up to this upper panel and redraw it and talk a little bit about the hormonal control of these cells. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw this parietal cell. And on its basal or surface, I'm going to put a series of G-protein coupled receptors. And then we'll work our way back to where the hormones are originating for these G-protein coupled receptors. So this parietal cell on its basal or side, as shown by the red hash marks, contains first a G-protein coupled receptor. This is a GPCR, G-protein coupled receptor, for gastrin. Well, gastrin is a peptide hormone. And among these epithelial cells down here in the gastric pit, I'll put this one in orange, is a cell called a G cell. And when we take in food, when we eat food, the same signal that told the chief cell to release pepsinogen also tells this G cell to secrete the peptide hormone. Gastrin. The gastrin is released from the basal lateral side of these cells. It would do us no good to put it into the lumen because it'd just be digested. So now we release the gastrin from the basal lateral side. It goes into the blood vascular compartment, circulates throughout the blood vascular system, finds its way back here to the parietal cell, and binds to the G protein coupled receptor. This G protein coupled receptor now impinges on both carbonic anhydrase as well as onto the as well as on to the hydrogen ion potassium transporter up here, probably through a phosphorylation event. This is the hydrogen ion potassium ATPase. And gastrin now upregulates. This hydrogen ion potassium ATPase. So one of the forms of control here is that we release gastrin from the G cell, the gastrin goes into the blood vascular compartment and finds its way back onto the parietal cell, telling it to release more acid. But there's another transmembrane protein here. I'll put this one out here, Let's put it in brown. 
And this is a G protein coupled receptor that binds histamine. Specifically, this is said to be an H2 receptor. Well, back here, I'll put in here a green cell. This cell is intended to be an entero, an entero chromophon like cell. We abbreviate these as ECL cells. They're just fancy mast cells. And so these ECL cells, with again the signal of eating food on their basal lateral side, will secrete histamine. So now the parietal cells, in addition to their receptors for gastrin, also contain a receptor for histamine. And when the histamine binds to this G protein coupled receptor. It too works on the carbonic anhydrase and it too works on the hydrogen ion potassium ATPase to increase the movement of hydrogen ion from the parietal cell into the lumen. Finally, there's a third character here. Put this one in blue, put it onto the side because I'm running out of room. And this is going to be a muscarinic receptor. And you'll recall that whenever you see this term muscarinic receptor, remember it binds acetylcholine. But it's a G protein coupled receptor for acetylcholine. Well, these parietal cells down here are innervated by postganglionic parasympathetic neurons. What do the postganglionic parasympathetic neurons release? What's the neurotransmitter? Ruff, ruff, ruff. Acetylcholine. The acetylcholine then combined, combined to the muscarinic receptors, and this too, remember, is a G protein coupled receptor. It too will follow parallel pathways affecting the carbonic anhydrase and affecting the hydrogen ion potassium ATPase. Yes? So, so what we haven't talked about here is there is this network of neurons. The enteric neuro nervous system contains many, many millions and millions of neurons. And part of those, that enteric nervous system will be to be postganglionic parasympathetic neurons. So there'll be preganglionic parasympathetic neurons whose cell bodies lie in the motor nucleus of 10, just like for the heart. Those neurons will join the vagus nerve and innervate the gut. And those preganglionic parasympathetic neurons will now synapse onto postganglionic parasympathetic neurons here in the enteric nervous system. And they will then synapse in turn onto, among other cells, but they will synapse onto these parietal cells. So again, part of the rest and digest. And as we said yesterday, the acetylcholine from the parasympathetic postganglionic neurons will then activate the salivary glands. That's why your mouth waters when you eat or even think about food. And similarly, you're also almost at the same time going to be activating these parietal cells to release acid. So you have these three basically converging pathways all through G protein coupled receptors, all dedicated to the regulation of the release of hydrogen ion. And next time what we'll do is we'll talk a little bit about what happens to the hydrogen ion and why that's important in the stomach.